and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Mr. Lewis, do you want to say anything before I ask for a moment of silence? Sure. Just, uh, you know, uh, obviously it's always uh, hard uh, when you uh, lose a staff member. And, you know, we lost a valued member of our transportation uh, team um, not too long ago. And uh, Mrs. Hat Records, Hatmaker Records was uh, a longtime driver. Uh, in our district and, you know, served many kids, uh, getting them to and from school safely. And, um, you know, she will be missed and our transportation transportation team is grieving uh, her loss so that uh, we would just like to ask for a moment of silence uh, in her memory. So I would ask that you join me in a moment of silence in memory of Cindy Hatmaker Records. Thank you very much. As a board, all five of us are elected to represent our entire community, which consists of 5,675 students, 840 staff members, and 35,276 community members. We use our mission and vision to guide us. I'd like to start tonight's meeting by revisiting these. Our mission is to cultivate a culture of academic excellence through inclusion and innovative learning opportunities for the whole child. Our vision is to empower all learners to reach their full potential in a globally competitive world. As we conduct our business tonight, I ask the board, administration, and community to do so in a respectful manner. Discussions are healthy, and while we may not always agree, I can assure you that each and every one of us want to do what is in the best interest of our students, staff, and community. <clears throat> I need a motion for the approval of the agenda, which includes addendum superintendents, uh, agenda item nine, personnel consent agenda one B, C, and two F. So moved. Second. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comifer? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. And Mr. Ballot? Aye. Agenda passes. I need a motion for the approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Any comments from the board, additions, corrections? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. And Mr. Ballot? Aye. Minutes are approved. Mrs. Weber, will you please provide an overview of the protocol for our meeting tonight? Thank you, everyone. Welcome to our Board of Education meeting this evening. Uh, welcome also to those of you who are attending virtually this evening. For those of you who, um, who are in the audience, we did have uh, copies of the agenda as well as a board policy that's going to be up for a second reading this evening um, as you walked in the door. For those of you who are, are uh, watching our meeting this evening from uh, the comfort of your own home, um, we ask that you uh, look at our district website. We do have the agenda and addendum uh, for the meeting posted on our Board of Education page and also on the Board of Education page under the face covering policy tab, you can access the board policy that will be reviewed this evening as well. Um, for those of you who would like to provide public comment this evening, we do have um, at least one person in our audience who will address the board um, on a, in, in the public participation section. Um, I have not received any other um, requests this evening. The, for those of you who would like to provide comment to the board on agenda items, uh, I would ask that you send an email if you are in the or if you are in our virtual audience to Bill Fritz, our moderator this evening at fritzw at sycamoreschools.org. Um, for those of you who are in the audience, Mr. Ballant will um, conduct the meeting at that point in time, asking if there are any public comment from audience members. Um, for those of you who are in the virtual audience, we do have a chat uh, feature within uh, the, the virtual meeting. We ask that you use that only to make us aware if there are technical difficulties, not to make comments about the meeting itself or um, to ask to participate in the meeting. So um, thank you, Mr. Ballant. 
Uh, I think I got everything for this section of the meeting and I'm looking forward to our next item very much. Thank you, Mrs. Weber. It is very exciting uh, to have our students performing for us once again. Um, this used to be a regular occurrence at our evening board meetings, uh, but for about the last two years, we've been unable to do that. So I can speak for the board that we're very excited um, to have our senior string quartet here. Mr. Lewis, would you like to add anything? I'm, I'm not gonna steal any thun thunder from their fantastic director, Dr. Santangelo. So I will have her talk about what you're going to experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. My name is Angela Santangelo, and I have the pleasure of serving as one of the orchestra directors for our Sycamore program. I'm at the junior high and high school, and Mr. Otto, Tanner Otto, is at our fifth and sixth grade. And I just wanted to go back to our mission statement uh, where we talked about um, educating the whole child, and I want to always uh, share how pleased we are and thankful to our community to our administration, to our superintendent, assistant superintendent, and to all of our board members for allowing us to include music as part of the education for the whole child, um, because that is just such a lifelong development. And so thank you for continuing to support that. It's been very exciting in the orchestra the last five years. We've had over 55% increase in our student enrollment. And tonight you are going to see the pinnacle of our program. We have four seniors, Grace Koo, Ivy Hahn, Chloe Barrett, and Ashlyn Thomas, who will be performing. They are truly an example of the best, uh, the highest musicians um, that we achieve here at Sycamore. They are all current or past members of the Cincinnati Symphony Youth Orchestra, which uh, sets the line at the top 5% of high school musicians in the greater Cincinnati area. They will be performing for you the first movement from Beethoven Symphony Number no. 4. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And Dr. Santangelo, if my day got to start like that every day, I understand why you have so many good days because that was amazing. Uh, and students, thank you so much. Uh, that's the highlight of our meeting. Hopefully it continues. That sets a good tone for our meeting. So we appreciate that. And good luck with your homework. I understand you needed to get to your homework. So thank you for that. I do have one request for public participation. Mrs. Weber, did you receive any others? Is Mrs. Mahoney in the audience? I don't believe I see her. Okay, that was a carryover from last meeting. So, I think okay, Ms. Stippold. Hi, my name is Carrie Dippold. I live at 11039 Todd T. Lane. I've had children in the district for the last 15 years. I'm speaking today about my concern with transparency of information. One of the board's duties listed in your website is informing the public concerning the progress and needs of the schools and to solicit and weigh public opinion as it affects the schools. I had emailed the board a few weeks ago because I had noticed at the prior two meetings that agenda items were being voted on that were not listed in the agenda that was posted for the public. I ask that all agendas and addendums please be posted to the board webpage prior to the meetings. Mr. Ballant replied and said that he would work with the administration to ensure these would be posted prior to the meetings going forward. And so thank you for that. However, I have found some additional examples when reading through the last two meeting agendas and minutes that I was able, unable to attend. I have found several instances that state the information is provided in a packet, but the packet is not posted on the board's webpage. The first example is from this special meeting that was just called last week on 210. The agenda item states that requested changes to the board policy EBEA, for use of facial coverings, proposed revisions are included in a packet. So unless a person is, a, is listening to the meeting, they would not know what the revisions were that were proposed. I was unable to attend this meeting as I was unaware that a special meeting was even called. I understand that meetings are recorded, but have not always been posted in the past or posted in a timely manner, or the audio quality is not always clear. Per today's agenda, there will be another reading of this revised policy, and a third reading may or may not be waived before a vote. But again, the revision says it's included in the packet. So persons not physically here or listening live would not know what you're proposing. The second example is in the 2-2 agenda and minutes. Under the personnel consent agenda 2A, Approve spring supplementals for the 21-22 contract year, information provided in packet. In that meeting, you only reference the personal consent agenda item 2A by number and letter when voting. There's no way for the public to know what the details are in item 2A, even if they are listening live. This is important to me as last year I had asked the administration about some information that I was unable to get. As the board is fully aware, it was a long and very difficult process to get the information uh, that the district is legally required to provide. I was told not so kindly that it was my responsibility to look through all the past minutes myself as a way to circumvent giving me the information. That information that I was looking for was not in the minutes for me to find as it was also in a packet, not posted. Are these packets only available to the board? Are they only available as paper copies to those who physically attend these meetings? Where do these packets exist? Does a person have to make a public records request in order to get the details of what's included in these packets? I have made public records requests. The, in, the information is not forthcoming very easy. It took a long time. In the interest of transparency, all information that is for public meeting sessions should be required to be posted for the public prior to the meetings, just as all the agendas should also be. And I'm also curious to know what the practice is on how you announce the special meetings to the public, just because I was not aware of the public or the special meeting. I'm wondering how I can find out about these meetings without checking the board's website every day. The special meeting is not on the board's calendar with all the other scheduled meetings that's listed on the board's website. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dippold. <clears throat> Moving on to the superintendent's agenda. Mr. Lewis, could you give us a health, healthy AVES update? <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Ballant. So um, happy to bring you the Healthy Aves update for this week. So uh, jumping right in, if you look at our case numbers for uh, as of this morning, 
Uh, we are at four student cases district-wide um, that are positive for COVID, and we have four staff positive cases. And then we have four students additional in quarantine. So as we have reported the last few weeks um, over the last few board meetings, you can see uh, the total number of students of eight that are impacted in some way by COVID out of Mr. Ballant, we went down by two students. Now we're at 5673, but uh, our EMIS coordinator updates us uh, every two weeks on our enrollment data. But you can see that's 0.1% of our district that's currently affected in some way by uh, COVID. And then our staff, there are four staff members that are positive, none in quarantine. So again, four out of 840 as a 0.5. And just as a reference, you know, we, we've talked about you know, the decisions to uh, remove masks or um, keep masks on. And, you know, the decision was made after at least two weeks of positive data. And the positive data trend has continued now into week four. So uh, I'll just, Mr. Fritz, if you could scroll to the next uh, slide and we'll go pretty quickly because these are all uh, previous day slides. But as of 2.15, which was obviously yesterday, we were still at eight and we had two staff members that were positive. Um, again, point one and point two. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the previous week, uh, 13 uh, total students that were positive, three that were in quarantine for a total of 16. Again, that's 0.3% of our district and five staff uh, out of 840. Next slide, please. And then we'll go just quickly now, uh, 11 and four. Next slide, please. 13 and three. 11 and four. And I, you know, I think it's important to point out as you look at each day, these are the numbers that I get each day. So what, what's the fluctuation in the days? You know, obviously students fall off uh, or staff fall off once they come out of the uh, required isolation period. So that's the adjustment and the change in the number. Um, so you can just see, I, I don't think we need to comment on every slide, but as we work back through the beginning of February, the numbers again, you, again, stayed uh, relatively low. And then as you get into the January dates, you know, this is as we started to look at, okay, when did the positive data start? It was towards the end of, of January. Um, the 19th was kind of towards the end of the surge. Um, the 27th certainly was as the surge started to show a lot more positive data and the surge kind of went away. But previous to this, um, right around the 10th of January, we made the decision to re reinstate a mask mandate. Next slide, please. And you can see why. When we were in mid-January, coming back after winter break, uh, we were able to go for a week with... Uh, the data starting to climb, and we started to see in-district or in-school surge, um, in-school spread, and we made a decision to put the facial coverings back on. So, you know, three days after we put the facial coverings back on, we had one of our highest totals, uh, 401 students that were impacted. And this was right after break, 1-5 was the beginning of the surge, and you can see uh, still very low percentages, but when we started to see the numbers climb, uh, obviously, we, we watch this data every single day, and it caused concern, especially enough that we needed to reinstate a mask mandate for a period of two weeks. Uh, next slide, please. So this was as of 2-9, um, just, to, and I want to be transparent, this data was not available until uh, Wednesday of last week. Um, none of the and for a while, OHA uh, or the Ohio Department of Health and the Ohio Hospital Association were not releasing uh, this data, which was the vaccination rates for ages five to 17. And this is important, critical data to us because it, it certainly informs our decision making. So as of 2-9, our two core zip codes were in the higher end, the 80 and 70% range for vaccination, which is very good comparative to, you can see the rest of the county uh, is not where it needs to be. 
or at least not where it needs to be in comparison to the other uh, pieces of the county where we currently, uh, the majority of our district is. Next slide is as of today's date, I uh, just received this today, you can see 45242 went into the 90% vaccination rate. Uh, 45249 is still very, relatively high in the 70%. And, you know, certainly that 45140, 45236, and 45241 are small portions of our school district. But out of our school district, those are the two largest zip codes that certainly have an impact. So, if you combine those two pieces of information, that's certainly why we felt comfortable making a decision to remove uh, masks with, um, again, we've had now three days of school, uh, well, two days of school this week with mask optional and you know, we're, we're not seeing that reinstatement of a high uh, number of cases being spread in our district. And um, from my understanding, talking to some of our community partners, um, some of the testing sites are closing down. Uh, the one at Weller Park is closing down because they're just not having anyone come through um, testing and the tests that they are getting are testing negative. So um, again, I don't have any data to support that. That's anecdotal from our community partners that we work with. The last slide I'll share is just our adult uh, vaccination rates. I get these updates from our partners at Hamilton County and you can see 45242. Um, is the highest uh, in the vaccination rates, just again, the ones that they share with us. Um, and 45249 is relatively high on that, that list as well. So um, we are doing really well. Um, I can tell you anecdotally, and you know, I see our elementary principal friends sitting back there. Uh, I have been in, in and out of buildings with them. And you know, I would say the majority of our students are still wearing masks. And that certainly is their I can tell you the Lewis boys, um, ones in fourth grade, ones in fifth grade, uh, you know, I gave them the option. That was their choice, what they wanted to do when they returned to school on Tuesday. And, um, you know, they, they have made that decision in their minds to continue to wear masks and that's okay. That's their decision. And uh, I support them as a father. So, um, but anecdotally, I'll tell you, based on what I've seen, you know, the majority of our students are still wearing masks. And again, we support their choice and support their decision in that. So um, that's the report I have for you tonight. Happy to answer any questions about the Healthy Aves update. And certainly any of my colleagues that are here would happy to jump in as well to, uh, you know, they're, they're a big part of, of what we do. And, you know, these decisions are not just me by myself sitting in a room going, well, what are we going to do today with mass decisions? It takes a team of people. There's you know, our, between our district flight team, uh, the, the DART team members that advise us and our building principals and assistant principals, you know, it's a joint decision making that, you know, is supported by a collaborative effort that we make sure that we all feel comfortable moving forward when we make these decisions. So um, one other comment, last comment I'll make before questions, <clears throat> you know, with the low data, our DART team has been an amazing group of people uh, that have met for the better part of two years. And many times as busy professionals, they give of their time to be available every week when we meet. Um, uh, and Dr. Karen Girardi, Dr. Andy Beck, um, and Mr. Matt Clayton are our community partners that, again, are not employees of the district. They're advising, they're, they're supporting us. Uh, they're giving of their time. Some of the time they're walking on rounds, holding a phone, talking with us uh, just to give their input and advice and, and guidance. So, um, you know, we respect their time enough that with the low numbers at our last meeting, we did decide to um, have discussions when warranted. You know, with low data, there really isn't much to review uh, when you have four positive cases and being that they're busy professionals, it does not feel good to pull them out of their work just to have a 30 minute meeting or an hour meeting um, to talk about the limited numbers. So we've agreed that if something new comes up that they might be aware of that we wouldn't be aware of, uh, they can make me uh, certainly aware of it and we'll call a meeting. Or if we see some issues with our data or want to discuss something internally, uh, then we would call a meeting. So we're keeping uh, our meeting on the calendar, but certainly it's going to be as an, on an as needed basis going forward. So that's all I have for that tonight.
Thank you. I have a quick question for a point of clarification. Are um, when people are calling in with a positive at home test, are we counting those still towards a positive test? Because I know the county is not counting positive at home tests. They're only counting PCR tests. Looking over at Mrs. Spencer, she's shaking her head. Yes, we do count those as part of our positive data. And my next, just so the, everyone's aware that there's a currently a 16% positivity rate in Hamilton County, Ohio, 32 per 100,000 and um, one third of the 45242 zip code is actually going to Indian Hill Public Schools. Any additional questions or comments from the board? We'll move on to uh, item number two, which is the second reading of EBEA use of face coverings. Mrs. Weber, if you would please read the first paragraph. So there has been a change uh, proposed to the first reading, um, which I'll now have Mrs. Weber read. Thank you, Mr. Ballant. And again, for those of you who are in our audience, um, or those of you this evening, if you didn't pick up a paper copy and want to read this at your leisure, uh, the revision as proposed is included on our district website on the Board of Education page under the face covering policy tab. So um, you can view the revision on our website. Uh, the uh, proposed uh, policy revision, I'm going to read the entire paragraph and highlight the additional um, sentence that has been included. During times of elevated communicable, communicable disease community spread, the superintendent may require students, employees, contractors, volunteers, and visitors to wear appropriate face coverings while on school grounds and or while on school provided transportation. And this is the new sentence that um, has been proposed for revision. Such decisions shall be consistent with the COVID-19 decision-making thresholds approved by the board. And then the next sentence does have one additional word to it. Um, it's the superintendent shall also, and the new word is also, have the authority to make exemptions to any face covering requirement for one or more of the reasons stated below. And then Mrs. Weber, if you could uh, just note that the final, read the final sentence, which has been stricken from the first reading. Okay, yes. And then at the very the end of general provisions, the um, uh, sentence has been removed. All decisions made by the superintendent pursuant to the policy shall be final. Can I ask a point of clarification, Mrs. Weber? is the first sentence that was added, or that, excuse me, the last sentence that was added in the first reading of the proposed revision on February 10th is no longer valid, that we should be looking at the second reading that we're looking at tonight. So the first reading is now completely not applicable. So this is really the first reading of the new changes, correct? This is a revision. I in. And I would have to clarify this, but I would assume because we are looking at the same policy that this is would be considered the second reading of revisions to the policy. So this would still count as a second reading for the policy revisions. So is it conceivable that on our third reading, where we would actually take a vote after the third reading, that there could possibly be an additional change or modification to the policy? As a result of the process with the third reading, there could be another revision at that point in time, and the board could call for a vote at that point in time under our policy. However, I believe the way the, the policy is written, it still just says a subsequent meeting. So I would assume if the board felt like they needed to take the time to um, continue to, to work through revisions to the policy, um, that they would take the time that they needed, however many readings that it would take to get the policy right. So there is a potential it could take more than the three readings. It just has to be at a subsequent, subsequent reading. Okay, thank you. 
Um, just so the public is aware, the board will have a discussion. And then if there is any member of the public that would like to address the board, we will do that after the board's discussions. Um, but I wanted to start um, our discussion with really coming to an understanding, you know, uh, with the board then that there are there are some fundamentals that I know we all mutually agree upon, and I want to keep that in mind as we have this, that discussion. First is, you know, that every board member um, does feel that the health and safety of our students is important to each and every one of us. Um, and then that we all agree to move forward during this conversation and subsequent conversations with respect to each other. Um, so I want, to, I want everyone to keep that in mind as we move forward with our discussion. Thank you. So I, with that, I will open it up to discussion on the policy. If it would be okay, I would like to start um, because I would like to go through and answer the questions that the board um, asked last uh, Thursday. That'd be okay. Yeah, I'll scoot it up in front of my face, sorry. Dear fellow board members, in last week's special meeting, we received a number of questions from you about our proposed amendment of the face covering policy, policy EBA, that we will try to answer comprehensively today. If we do not fully address your questions, please let us know. Number one, it was not clear to the board of one, how under our proposal, the superintendent can make a decision given that the exercise of the policy is subject to the board's control. And two, if that requires a public meeting before a decision can be made. The board's policy manual provides under code BFCA that when appropriate, the board reviews procedures developed by the administration to implement policy. The board revises or nullifies such regulations only when they are inconsistent with policies adopted by the board or when they are not in the best interest of the district. So this provides that the superintendent develops procedures to implement the board's policies. The implementation needs to be transparent so that the board can make sure that it is consistent with the policy and in the best interest of the district. To us, this means that by default, it is the role of the board to understand how our policies are implemented. We believe it to be appropriate that we stipulate that the board can review the implementation of, face, of the face covering policy. And if the board believes that it is not in the best interest of the district to revise or nullify the implementation. That is the case for all of our board policies. For every board policy, the board can review how the superintendent implements them because none of them provide that the superintendent's decision is final. The only exception is the policy EBEA. Dr. Steger and I see no reason why policy EBEA should be excluded from the board's normal oversight. To question number two. We were asked if the proposed amendment would require the board to approve the superintendent's decision on the use of masks. No, policy BFCA provides procedures need not be approved by the board in advance of issuance, except as required by state law. The same applies to decisions by the superintendent under these procedures. They do not require board approval. As a fellow board member said last Thursday, we do not call a board meeting to decide to close the schools for inclement weather. That is absolutely correct. That is not what we are requesting. The only question is if we want the board to be able to exercise its usual oversight in line with our board policies. Question number three, we were asked when the board would have input into the superintendent's decision. The same answer applies. We're serving the right excuse me, reserving the right of the board to review the implementation of policy does not mean that the superintendent's decision regarding the exercise of the policy requires prior board approval. Question number four, along the same lines, we were asked when the superintendent can act on his own. The answer is the same because the board has the right to review how the superintendent implements board policy does not mean the superintendent cannot implement policy. Question number five, there was some concern about terminology. We use the term that the superintendent's exercise of EBA policy remains subject to the control of the board. We agree, of course, and that was the question, sorry. So there was some concern about how EBA policy that we made last week, the revision that we made last week, 
created a sentence that said it remains subject to the control of the board. We agree, of course, that we do not want to create any confusion. We want, we, we propose that the superintendent's action under the mass policy are subject to the control of the board. That made sense to us because the board derives its control from the board policies. But to avoid confusion, we have provided another draft pursuant to which the last sentence that the superintendent's decision under this policy are final is deleted, which is the current version we provided today. Then as with all of our other policy, the board can exercise its oversight role as it should. And the final question that you asked us was number six, the six one. One of the board members raised the point that the default policy is optional mask bearing. And then only if the federal government, the state government or the local government or the superintendent take action would masking be required. We agree with the first point. As written, the face covering policy authorizes the superintendent to require face coverings. This gives him discretion. The exercise of discretion must be reasonable, of course, and cannot be arbitrary. But within those boundaries, yes, he has discretion. We do not agree with the second statement that only the government or the superintendent can require masks. Policy EBEA delegates the board's authority regarding face coverings to the superintendent. The board could not delegate such authority if it itself did not have the authority to require face coverings. Thank you. Any, Mr. Yeah, Cameron. Mrs. Bitter, I 100% agree with your last comment. I mean, the previous version of EBEA was a mask required policy. And by definition, the board enacted that to comply with the state standards. So I 100% agree that the, the board has that authority to put the masking mandate in place. So, I mean, no, no debate on that at all. I, I would agree with that. It's the question of um, you know, how we move forward on this particular policy. I did wanna ask one clarifying question. Um, however, last week, it was my understanding that the request was that we would have the board, that the superintendent, if I paraphrase this correctly, the superintendent could act without board um, um, confirmation to, to require masks, but that there was a request that the board confirm to remove masks. And I'm just trying to understand if, if that is the intent still, because I don't see that within the policy as written, or has that, is that intent been changed? The intent is to make this policy consistent with all of the other policies so that there's board control or oversight, excuse me, board oversight over the procedures and the regulations that the superintendent creates for every policy that we create. That's the intent, to keep this policy consistent with, with every other policy that we have. That's, that's the intent. Is that what you mean? And to be able to look at, to be able to look at the process, to be able to look at the procedure. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wanting to make sure the language is consistent with what that you what you were looking for and, and what I thought you were looking for last week appears maybe that it has changed. Well, we, you know, what we did was we, I mean, we, when we created the second draft because we knew there was some confusion, um, our first intent was what I just said, to make sure that there is oversight by the board on this policy as it is with every other policy that exists that we have. Um, but the other thing that the, we, when we asked for the attorney to draft this version of this, um, they, he uh, suggested that we add in the line at the top that all decisions would be consistent with the thresholds that were already approved by the board. We cannot, if we, if we don't have the ability to look at and have oversight, at least this is our argument, that to have oversight over the procedure, right? Because the procedure would be exhibit A. If we don't have that authority, then we can't weigh in on that part. And so that was the add-on was suggested by 
legal counsel to add that in there with the intent of us having the ability to make sure that the, the procedure, the, the, the process is being completed in a transparent way. And we would have oversight over that. It doesn't mean that we are the ones that make the weekly decision or the biweekly decision, I mean, or the every other week decision. The, the question is simply, do we have any oversight over the procedures that are taking place to come to the decision? Because we believe that it should be very transparent, very clear and very consistent. And the public should be able to see every single week exactly how we did it for the exact same reasons. So that's what we could, we would have the ability to do that um, if if we had oversight like we do every other policy. Yeah. I, I would submit that I would find common ground on that. I think I don't think there's any board member who would not want transparency. I, I'm maybe checking the, the group, but I, I would think that we would all desire transparency and the execution of the process. Mr. Ballant, Mrs. Weiss. Transparency. I, I yes, Mr. Ba um, Comerford, I agree that transparency is important. I, I guess where I'm struggling is when you say oversight of the procedure, because I'm thinking of the many procedures that govern our all of our buildings, and and how you, Mrs. Bitter, and Dr. Steger would propose that we have oversight over every procedure that happens in our school district. We, we actually do under board policy. It doesn't mean that we exercise it always, but in the event that we needed to, and there's two reasons why we would potentially need to do that. Um, if the policies were inconsistent um, with another board policy, that would be a reason why we would oversee that, that procedure or if it was not in the best interest of the district. So it doesn't mean that it happens a lot, but the board has that oversight and there are you know, many cases where we would never need to exercise that, but there are sometimes cases where we should, and this is why we requested a special meeting. We, we wanted it to occur much sooner than it did, but we needed for obviously all of our board members have to have time and their schedule to make that occur. But we, we believe that this policy, this face covering policy is so important to the district that we shouldn't make this the only one that doesn't have oversight um, of all of our policies. And that's what, that's what, the way it exists. That's what, that's what it says. It's the only policy that we have that says specifically all decisions made by the superintendent pursuant to this policy shall be final. It's the only one. This is better. Um, thank you. You know, I understand the importance of this policy and the revision of the policy, you know, but I also, I, I wanna make sure the board gets this right. Um, you know, we are not in a place now where I feel we need to rush. Our COVID cases are low, it, they're dropping in the community. So, you know, I really think the board needs to make sure we get this right. Um, you know, my, my question is, you know, we're, we're referring to decision-making thresholds, you know, which as you state were, um, I believe, um, addendum A or exhibit A, um, yet, you know, Exhibit A, addendum A is, is clearly outdated because it states that we need to revisit these after vaccination occurs in the five through 11 year olds. So I, for one, speaking just for, for myself, have trouble rewording a policy and voting on a policy referring to threshold decision making um, guidelines that are outdated. We, you know, we as a society has learned a lot since COVID um, and even since August, since those were put in place. Um, so I, I'm struggling with a policy that refers to absolutes within um, an exhibit. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to put that in there because if we take that out, it would still exist that we would have the ability to, to look in it. This, are you talking about exhibit A? Yes. Okay, so exhibit A is a, is a, it's a process. It's a procedure, it's not a policy. The policy is actually e, EBEA. Um, so we as a board adopt policies and the superintendent must create regulations or procedures to implement those policies. That's his role. It's not our role to micromanage him. It's his role to create the procedure and the regulation. And it's our job to make sure he does it. And the way we do that is we look at 
the process. We look to make sure that it's transparent. We make sure that it's in the best interest of the district. And this is a particular issue that is very, it's very new. It's very important. It's ever changing. And this is why Dr. Steger and I brought this to the board simply to have this conversation. We are in no rush. We wanna get it right. We're concerned that there could be future spikes and we just wanna make sure that our board is fully you know, aware and ready and that we have the procedures that we as a board feel comfortable with moving forward. That is all we're asking. And we are in no rush. We can work as long as we need to to get this, get this done. But that's our request. I appreciate that, Mrs. Uh, Bitter. I, I agree agree with the, the getting it right is the most important part. Um, and I'm thankful that we're in a position right now where we we do have the time to, to get it right. I, I personally think your point about the board authority, um, it, it resonates with me. The striking of the last line does not cause me any um, concern. Um, I, that part I, got, I have, I, I think we, I could find common ground on that particular phrase being deleted that all decisions made by the superintendent pursuant to this policy shall be final. I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, by definition, the board has the policy making authority. We could, we could at any time draft an EBEA policy that requires mask. We could also draft at any time an EBEA policy that does not allow masks. I'm not proposing that, you know, we do do those uh, policies. I think this one that was struck was more of a common, um, a common ground type of a policy that was allows for agility and flexibility. I do share Mr. Balance um, um, concerns on the de decision making thresholds. I, I believe since we have the time, it might be prudent to take that uh, a, a Appendix A or the decision making thresholds and re look and revise and update those with the latest knowledge and understanding from our um, a professional medical community. I would be very open to having uh, a, ref, a reframe on a reframe a reframing of the, that those particular guidelines. One point I'd like to add is um, Mrs. Bitter and I did discuss. There's approximately 20% of the district that have pre-existing medical conditions that we're trying to help support in this. Also, um, having some oversight that represents over 1,100 students in our district. So that's a lot of people. So that's one of our concerns. We want to make sure that those 1,100 students also have some kind of voice here. Um, Dr. Stickers, can you help me understand where that data is coming from? That's not a number I've ever heard. It's from uh, Mayo Clinic and hold on, there's a couple of places last week. No, but are you, you're referring to, I think you said how many students we have in our district. Right. The 20% you're saying are 20% of our students in our district. Where is that data Approxim coming from? Approximately 20%, that's overall in Ohio. Um, the data for children. But what I'm saying is it's not just severe medical conditions. We're also talking like asthma that is are a you, severe condition, just so we understand that that's a lot. Clarify, are you extrapolating state data to our district? You are saying the state data says 20%, so you are imposing a 20% in our district as well. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I don't have access so to it's individual not, health data. Okay, thank that's, you. It's protected data, so I cannot have access to that. Yeah, it's Kaiser Family Health Foundation federal data. Yes, it's it's it does break it down by state, and those are state numbers. But obviously, we don't have access to. I mean, in Ohio, it on the Ohio Department of Education website, it says that we have 10% students with disabilities, but that doesn't necessarily capture um, children with special health care needs. Um, but that's the data that we're referring to. But you're right. It's not necessarily specific to our district. That is correct. That's why I think we have to be really careful. It's sort of like toothpaste coming out of the tube. Like when you say something as fact and you're taking information from a state or a federal study and then, and then imposing that on our numbers, I think you have to be really, really careful. So if we need to get more specific information about our student population, then that's maybe something that we can ask um, Mr. Lewis for, if that's something that the whole board is interested in seeing. I think it would be a really good thing to someday know that answer, actually. I, I agree with you, um, Mrs. Weiss. Thank you. 
one item that I would be really interested in learning more about for the decision making thresholds is the relationship between the vaccination rates and the, the decision making. I have seen different journal studies that highlight at a certain vaccination rate percentage that uh, it changes uh, decision metrics on on vaccination rates. And because we haven't had that data exposed to us that Mr. Lewis just shared um, with us recently, I really think those thresholds would benefit from that type of analysis. I think we have experts in our community that could help us uh, with that. And so I, I, at a certain level, my understanding is that you reach a certain level of vaccination rate that mask wearing is, is not um, required anymore. That's, that's my understanding of the studies. So, and I think we're maybe not quite to that point, but close to that point. I just wanted to say, I'd, I'd like to hear more from our medical professionals on, on this point. I agree. Do we have common ground on that, that point? Mr. Comfort, I just want to make a comment about your, your recent comment. I, I spoke to one of our public health commissioners, uh, Mr. Clayton today, and, you know, I just ask him, you know, with all the data that we have, because he's the one, you know, he sends me a lot of data, he sends me a lot of, we talk frequently, um, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed getting to know him and getting to understand all of this data. I'm a little bit of a data nerd myself, so I like to dig in and understand what's the impact to our district. And he said, you know, based on all the information that he is seeing, he feels that our community is at that point. You know, it, it, it isn't. And he said, certainly people have to make those choices for themselves if they have other conditions. But from a community standpoint, he felt strongly that we're in a good place as a school district and to not make decisions based on our school district from all the other, you know, there's a lot of other data up there that I could point to that could certainly say, well, we shouldn't do that. But it's all outside of the Sycamore community schools. It wouldn't be you know, it'd be the low vaccination rate in parts of Hamilton County. You know, I have to do what I think is best for this school district based on the information that we have. And so, you know, when I talk with him, we're always focused on Sycamore Community Schools, our core zip codes, and, and making those decisions for our district. And certainly, I recognize that other school districts have to make the decisions for their communities based on what they're seeing. So I don't think it's as you know, a lot of the community members that contact me, and certainly uh, I try to respond to everybody on both sides of whatever their feelings are about either masks or not having masks. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not a disagreement on my part of where, where do you think we should be? It's really looking at data and letting that drive our decision making and not, you know, a, an opinion. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I don't have an opinion on it so much as what is the data telling us and when do we feel safe uh, to allow our students to attend school in this manner? And, you know, we've, we've been able to do that successfully now for a week and a half. And they're, they're, again, I don't, it's certainly not a free for all, you know, looking at our elementary principals, there's plenty of students still uh, masking up. There's still plenty of upper level students still masking up. And again, that's a choice that they have to make as they work through the process of, of what we do, what we're doing. Um, I think it is important to remember that Exhibit A was approved, you know, by the board. So if it's something that you want us to take a look at, or if you want to direct myself and our team to bring back a revision, we're happy to do so. Um, it, it, in a, you know, I wanted to other, the other comment I wanted to make that I've heard the word transparency thrown around a lot. This document, Exhibit A, is, is available on our website. It is actually on the same page as the facial covering policy. So I, you know, I, I couldn't be any more clear that our team has nothing to hide about COVID data. We don't benefit from hiding any COVID data. We don't change COVID data. We don't adjust it. We put it out there. This year has been challenging with everything else that we have to do. Our, our professionals, our educational professionals are trying to teach while dealing with all these other things. Our administrators are trying to do their job while dealing with this other portion of their job that they didn't ask for, and they're doing it magnificently. Um, our kids are learning, they're growing, they're hitting uh, levels of achievement that we haven't seen since 2019. They're getting back to what I would consider normalcy, and that's the work of our professionals, of our teachers, of our classified staff supporting them. 
but I just want to make sure it's clear. We're, we're transparent as we can be. What we're not going to do is come up with some magic number. As soon as we hit that, we're going to make a decision. It's never been that way in the two years that we've had to deal with this. It's just not that simple. I wish it was because it would make my life a heck of a lot easier to navigate, but it, it really isn't that hard and fast or that black and white to say, if we hit this, this is the decision we're going to make. Um, so I hope that's, that's understood. And I hope the community feels strongly that we're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to not be transparent. You know, our COVID dashboard this year has been difficult. We just made a new rendition of our COVID dashboard that we're reporting weekly because it was a better use of our time. Um, with not contact tracing and kind of reducing that amount of time, it's a better um, version of what we were putting out. And uh, so far, since we put that version out, and thank you, Mr. Fritz, for your work with the team on that, uh, we have not received the normal complaints that we had received previously about the dashboard that kept crashing. So I uh, just want to make those couple of comments on behalf of our team. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Mr. Lewis. Um, and, and I would echo you know, the fantastic work that your team has done, you know, navigating us through all of this. You know, uh, you know for me, it comes down to either we, we, either we strike the sentence about COVID-19 decision-making thresholds completely from the policy, or, or we take a step back and, re and review um, the threshold policy. Any additional comments from the board? I just maybe ask a follow-up question for Mr. Lewis, and thank you for the clarifications. Um, would you say that the decisions that you have made um, for the entire year have been consistent with the decision making thresholds approved by the board? With, I would say one small exception, and it's just wording. You know, um, when you look at recommended and encouraged versus optional, you know, I don't know if that that connotation means anything differently, but the reason that we came with optional this time versus recommended and encouraged was intentional. And, you know, our our staff with low numbers, I did not want our staff to feel pressure that they could not make that choice for themselves. And, you know, I think our staff is still doing an amazing job of, you know, when they're working in close proximity with students, especially students that are either medically fragile or they have significant needs, or um, it may just be that the student doesn't feel comfortable being outside of a mask. Our staff still mask up and go work close in proximity with that student and go back and move away from them and take it off. So um, we wanted our staff to feel comfortable that they could make that decision for themselves. So whether or not that wording, again, you know, that would be something that I would adjust because, you know, it is listed in there. It's not required. Um, so, um, that would be the only thing that I would say is a little bit of an adjustment, Mr. Comerford, but overall you can see clearly on, on our, um, trigger points that school data and quarantine information, uh, case numbers, especially local zip codes were, uh, paramount in making our decisions. And that really became very clear as Mr. Balance stated, these were put into place really before we knew a lot more. Um, and a lot of our students were unable, uh, maybe just just uh, able to get vaccinated. So uh, a lot has changed in the, you know, the six plus months since we crafted these. And, you know, I would tend to agree either it's time to strike them and, and be comfortable with the way we're making decisions. And, you know, I would, I 100% support the decisions that we made based on you know, they haven't been easy. This hasn't been an easy year. It's not been an easy year to navigate for, um, I've been in the district 10 years, but first year as superintendent. And I can tell you, I figure if I can live through this year, I'll live through most years. Um, but I, I believe in our team and I believe in the people that advise me. And I can confidently say that I don't make these decisions by myself. I get a lot of input. And I will tell you that the people sitting to my right if I was making a bad decision, and Mrs. Weber, I know you're to my left, so you included, and you, Mr. Fritz included as well, they would tell me if I was making a bad decision, as well as our principals and assistant principals. And I take that in because we are a team and we have to make good team decisions together so that we can confidently lead this district. So um, I appreciate the question. I appreciate you know you asking, but I do believe we've implemented these with fidelity and 
and, and doing the best we can to make sure that we make good decisions for our students and our staff uh, with safety always in mind. Can I just ask a quick question to follow up on that? What has been done, like at what threshold with new cases per 100,000 in Hamilton County and also like the CDC level of transmission and the state you know, positivity rate? Have we been putting weight on that? Is there a number, if that goes above a certain number that was decided upon? Just so I can understand, because I still am feeling like I'm not understanding completely what those numbers, how those are influencing the decision. As I've stated, we look at that data, but it doesn't influence the decision because that's not Sycamore data. Um, you know, I, I understand why the CDC and uh, even the county have to make recommendations based on the data they're seeing, but they don't look at Sycamore community schools when they make their recommendations. They're looking at either national data, uh, state data, local data, county data that is not just specific to Sycamore community schools. And I can't worry about what goes on out in other communities. I have to really focus in on what goes on in our community and what is it telling us. So although we do look at it and we talk about that, uh, it, it's not an, a huge impact to the decisions that we're making. And that's why it's under just trigger points for review and not necessarily things that are impacting our work. Good question, though. I'd just like to weigh in, Mr. Bowne. I would, I would prefer that we review and revise the decision-making thresholds. It's been six months, and I think we could um, uh, review and revise those in whatever process we think is the appropriate one uh, versus um, keeping them as is. I'd like to review and revise those to... I think we said up front, we have the time to do the right thing. I'd, I'd like to review and revise those. I would too. I'll just say, I hope we revise them and never have to use them ever again. So, so Mr. Lewis, we'll ask that you in, internally work with your team to come up with a revision to threshold guidelines. We're today, happy to do so. Uh, yep. And bring it back to the board. Sounds good. Anything else from the board before we move on to any public participation? Do we have any public participation around EBEA use of uh, face coverings? I did receive, I received a request from that Mr. Bowser, is that correct? Okay. So Mr. Bowser has asked to address the board on this topic. Great. Yes, sir. So I've heard multiple things. Probably the best thing that I've heard is Mr. Lewis keeps addressing choice. You know, he has sons that go to school. They decide to wear a mask. He's their father. He accepts that choice. I think really that's what we need to do is accept choice. I understand that you're looking after the safety and health of the students, but I'm the father and I'm looking after my son's education. I got six-year-old twin boys. We moved here from California a year ago to get out of a hellhole that California is to come to Ohio and not deal with this stuff two years later. And to sit here and be talking about masks still and them wearing them in school, I can tell you Masks don't work. Fauci's flip flop back and forth on this so many times. Wear masks, don't wear masks, wear six masks, wear 12 masks. I can tell you what, I learned a lot this last weekend by watching the Super Bowl, which took place in California, which nobody had masks on and they were all gathered around. That said a lot to me. Said a lot to me. But it's hard to believe that after two years, we're still talking about this. You know, it was supposed to be six weeks to flatten the curve, and here we are, still talking about this. Um, I think the biggest thing that's been lost during this whole COVID is common sense. People have lost their common sense. People have lost their common sense, but they want to tell me what is right and what is wrong to do with my kids. That doesn't fly with me. Um,
So as far as I work in the medical field, we've talked about vaccines, we've talked about masks, people have got vaccinated. I can tell you about people that have got vaccinated. I got vaccinated and I still got COVID. I wear a mask at work. I work in the medical field. I wear a mask at work and I still got COVID. People wear masks every day and they still get COVID. I can tell you about all these coworkers that I have, all have been vaccinated because we have to. It's the only field that for some reason, the government said you have to be vaccinated. Every other job, they decided you didn't have to. But in the medical field, you have to be vaccinated. But I can tell you about all these people that have been vaccinated, double vax, got their booster, and still got COVID. So vaccines really don't work either. So you're talking about numbers, you're talking about statistics, you're talking about vaccinated people, unvaccinated people. But why don't you talk about the students that have got COVID and now they have herd immunity. And sir, now- Sir, your three minutes are up. So could you please wrap up? Okay. So basically what I'd like to say and finish up saying is, my kids have been damaged more by wearing masks and child, child psychologists, child psychiatrists will tell you that. From kindergarten last year, their speech enunciation, their reading has all diminished. And they were just passed through kindergarten. And if I have to hold them back first grade, that's what I'll do because they're just not going to get skated by. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Weber, any other additional public participation? I do not have any additional requests. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Mr. Lewis, moving on to item number three, master facility plan update. I should have known. There you go, Mr. Lewis. That's right. Well, good evening, Mr. President, fellow members of the board. Uh, I stand here today excited to tell you the overall project remains on time and on budget. Um, that's exciting. Uh, I also want to share with you just some kind of high level updates of some of the projects that are happening across the district. Um, and then we've changed our presentation a bit for you this evening to just highlight some of the projects versus going through all of them. As I mentioned previously, some of our projects, um, there's not a lot of momentum day in and day out. And so um, a couple of things just to share with you. Number one, we have a celebration for you this evening. Uh, this past Monday, we had the opportunity um, to attend the Board of Site Arrangement for the City of Blue Ash. Um, we had our proposed permanent transportation facility in front of them, um, and we got unanimous approval from that board to continue to move forward. And just to put that in perspective for you, that's a big step forward in getting the permanent transportation compound set. Um, we still continue to do our due diligence. We have 120 days to complete that. Um, before the design phase begins. So um, we're excited and we're thankful for the city of Blue Ash for helping us move this project forward. And Ms. Weber and I had the opportunity to thank them in person on behalf of the board at the meeting on Monday. Uh, the other thing that I just wanna share too, some excitement around our athletics facilities. I know there's been a lot of discussion at the board level, um, getting things moving, and there's some items on the agenda this evening to approve contracts, but we should start seeing some dirt being moved um, by spring break. And so I know everybody's going to be excited. We've had a lot of questions on when's it happening? When's this going to move? And so we'll start to see some of that movement occur. Um, and then lastly, this evening, I know in front of you, you have a contract um, for furniture at EH Green, a bid contract. And I just wanted to uh, just preface that by saying this is a big step forward. We all know that Green's going to be opening next school year. And so this is one of those kind of last big things we'll have in front of you as we start to uh, fill out the inside of the building. Movement on the outside has been happening, and I'll share with you here in a second um, some of the uh, construction items. But those are all, in my opinion, some really big celebrations that we have going on that I wanted to share with you all. So if you take a look at the screen up here, just some pictures from EH Green, um, three kind of important things going on here. Number one on the left, you'll see the drywall is going up inside. And so as you walk through the space, you, you are now seeing um, the classrooms, the ceiling grids, um, you can actually see where the extended learning spaces are. So it's starting to look like a school on the inside. Um, the next two pictures are just showing some out, outside work that maybe you don't see from the road. Um, most importantly, the photo there on, in the middle, they're putting our windows in. Uh, the windows have been in site, on site for a couple of weeks now, um, but due to some labor issues, they haven't been able to be installed, but they're getting in. Um, that's a positive step forward because 
um, that again allows our drywall to begin to cure. Um, moisture mitigation begins and we can start looking at flooring next. And then lastly, the picture there, um, you see we're um, starting to do some of the final concrete work around the building for sidewalks. Um, this is exciting because um, after they get this finished, we can really doing some of that finalized site development work um, that was just going to make it look more finished than it does right now. I know I get the questions. Green's opening next year? Absolutely. That's the plan. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to Sycamore Junior High, um, the two buildings I chose to highlight tonight is just our two that um, you know, are getting the new buildings that are coming out of the ground. And so uh, can you go back to that first slide there just really quick? Sorry about that. Or is that the first slide? <coughs> All right, cool. Thanks. Nope, you're good. All right, go back to that one. I thought there were two <laughs> slides. <laughs> I'm just making them work this evening, you know? Like, uh, in those pictures there for the junior high, that second slide, you can see that um, similar to EH Green, um, the scaffolding's coming down from the brick layers. You can also see that the windows are being installed. Um, the other thing that I think is most compelling on that property that you'll notice if you drive by is the transportation compound um, has been removed and the expansion of the theater area is continuing. So the two last remaining pieces of the junior high to come out by the ground is that kind of Area A, which is the um, which would be the arts, would be the administration ring, but also the community theater that's going to be a part of that project. Um, and so I'm sure we'll be in front of you talking more about those components of the project as well. Um, as always, when it comes with the junior high, I always say that we are optimistically cautious um, about moving forward because we still have a ton of work left in removing um, a very aging building. Um, but also some more site work that occurs on that property with bringing up the theater, um, but also just um, parking, et cetera, et cetera. That's the updates I have for you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Lovell. Absolutely. Uh, moving on, I need a motion for the change orders for Sims Elementary School renovation project, GMP number three. So moved. Second. Any comments, Mr. Lovell? Any questions from the board? I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the change orders for Sycamore Junior High School construction project. So moved. Second. Any questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval with the contract with Mott's Group Construction Services for Sycamore High School Stadium Turf Installation. So moved. Second. I have a quick question about this one. On the top part, it refers to the high school football field. Is it also going to be lining for other sports? Yeah. That's my question. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So that should actually probably read a multi-use multi, multi -use stadium. That's what we've been referring it to. And so, yes, it will be marked for other sports and it will also be where our marching band will practice as well. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. I just I just did have Mr. Lobo. I did have a question on the timetable. It, it's looked like the turf would not be complete until middle of September. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the entire scope of the project, I just got this the other day. We're still shooting for a mid-August um, completion date. Um, I, I will be completely transparent and say, as I look at the timelines and everything like that, we're most likely looking for a Labor Day finish. Um, at the same rate, like any of our projects, there's areas that we can accelerate it as well. Um, and part of my job is to hold those accountable with our construction firms to try to beat any time frame that we have. So um, I think the safe bet here, what they're putting is September, but the time frames that we have with our contractors are mid-August. Um, like I said, in late, latest, latest that we see would be Labor Day. Yeah, I was just checking because obviously the football season starts Correct. Um, mid-August. And I just wanted to make sure if we knew up front, we weren't going to deliver against that 
Yep. Timetable. And, and we've been um, in contact with Mr. Harden. You know, he is in a part of all of our meetings um, to help be as, as transparent as we can with the teams that are going to be using the space, the timeframes, um, when the bids came back, when we could start site development work and things like that, that March 15th date was popping up. We knew we were going to have a tight time frame. Um, but again, you know, everything could come down the weather as well this spring. So hope, hope we'll, we'll pray for a dry spring. But again, we're hoping for a mid-August, um, late, late, if we have to, Labor Day weekend. Thank you. You're welcome. Any additional questions? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. And Dr. Steger? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the contract with USCO Sports Lighting LLC Construction Services for Sycamore High School Stadium Lighting Installation. So moved. Second. Any questions from the board? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the contract with Continental Office EH Green Intermediate Furniture. So moved. Second. Any questions? Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the job description revision. So moved. Second. Any comments, Mr. Lewis? Sorry, I was looking down my agenda. It must be uh, it's an lower. <laughs> it was lower than I was currently at. So uh, give me one second. There we go. So uh, <clears throat> it was just time to update uh, our high school assistant principal uh, job description. Obviously, we've we've gone down an assistant principal this year. We kind of backfilled it in different ways, and it's time to get our uh, team back to full strength. So um, in order to do that, uh, we felt like the adjustment to it needed to be more focused on what are some of those things that we're going to need in an, a high school assistant principal? Or what are some of those things that we expect uh, for our high school assistant principals? And I would say probably the key over, overarching theme is instructional leadership. Um, that's what we expect of our um, assistant principals. And certainly they have task management. They have to do discipline. Those things have not changed. But um, with the curriculum review and the you know, increased amount of curricular responsibilities. We wanted to make sure that was accurately reflected in the uh, job description. So, okay, Mrs. Wagner gave me the thumbs up. So there's I, nothing. I, I have a missing. question. I had a question um, about it. Um, I noticed that in the wording, we, we say for allowing, allows for tackling challenges of the fiercely competitive and constantly changing 21st century economy. And I was just wondering why we don't f refer to our mission or our vision on, on uh, empowering, you know, somebody who can work on a, getting kids ready for, to reach their full potential in a globally competitive wor world. It seems like you're trying to say something similar but it seems different to me. Um, it seems like it's not consistent with our mission and vision. Um, that was one thing. And then another part of it at the bottom, I know you, I agree with what you're saying. I'm not, I'm, you know, we definitely need to update it, but some of the things, some of those things at the end that were taken out about abilities, um, to understand um, and maintain effective working relationships with students, peers, and parents. And maybe you move that up towards the top, but I definitely think that's a really important quality. There's one section under other skills and abilities that I was concerned that that was coming out. I just wanna make sure that that's in there too, because I know that assistant principals are really working very heavily often with our families 
um, they're the problem solvers, a lot of times the crisis management people, and I know that um, from experience. So I just wanted to so, respectfully ask <laughs> if you no, may I, consider I that that's important and then perhaps potentially aligning some of that wording up towards the top so that when that applicant sees that, they realize that they need to be able to hand, you know, align themselves with our mission and vision for our district. So our job descriptions, uh, Dr. Davis is going back through with her expertise to really try to pare them down. They're too long. You know, this one used to be three pages long. And a lot of that additional information she was able to capture in shorter statements above. So, you know, we're happy to take any feedback and certainly weave it into our job descriptions. We can certainly look at, um, you know, I can tell you why we haven't put the mission and vision on our uh, job descriptions because it's adjusted over the course of a number of years. So um, as much as we captured some of the thoughts from it, it, you know, stating the mission and vision, if we did that on every job description, anytime it were to adjust due to board adjustment, we would have to go back and revise all of our job descriptions. So we try to stay high level and generic with our job descriptions a little bit because we do want the high level duties to be called out um, in our job descriptions, but certainly we'll take your feedback. And I know Dr. Davis was taking copious notes back there as she always does. And uh, we'll, we'll make those re small revisions to it. Thank you very much. All right, from a procedural standpoint, Mrs. Weber, do we, make a motion to amend the job description? How, how do we go about that? I would recommend that we amend the approval of revisions, um, allowing or authorizing the director of human resources, I'm trying to think too. <laughs> basically to, to enact or make the changes as noted in the meeting or as noted by the board. Is there a time critical need to approve this tonight or could it be revised and approved at a subsequent meeting? Our, our urgency would be to get it posted because um, we wanna beat other people to the punch in getting it posted. And with a next meeting being two weeks away, um, you know, I think I'll just say Dr. Davis has made a concerted effort to really work hard to get our postings out um, early. Um, and we've lost out on candidates posting later because the best candidates are looking now uh, for jobs. So um, if, if you're willing to amend the um, policy rec or policy <laughs> job description recommendation, we would be happy to make those alterations and bring it back for a final approval. But it, it'll, irregardless, it would allow us to move forward with posting the position and uh, getting it out there so that we can get a, a, a candidate pool identified quickly. And Mrs. Better, you'd be okay with that? I'm okay with it. I, just, I mean, you're saying get, go ahead and get it out there and not make the revision, or you're saying get it out there and then at a later and still revise it, but two, two, two weeks later, we'll just have a different version up. That way we can, is it, is it put on our webs? How is, is it digital or is it something that I just, I honestly, when I see it, I think it doesn't represent our district, to be honest with you. The, that one section, that one section, I think it's, I think I think it would be better to align it more with what we're trying to do with teaching our kids based on our mission and vision. My, that's what I'm always thinking about is that mission and vision statement. So I just think when we, when we talk about that with prospective employees that we should hone in on that. Um, the word fiercely, I don't think is a great word. How about we propose to just strike that language that way we don't have to bring back a revision. Dr. I also, Davis, does that I also, work? Mr. Lewis, can we also maybe hear from Dr. Davis? I'm sorry, you're sitting in the back, but I'm looking at you. In terms of, I, I don't know if it's standard to put a mission and vision in a job description. If you could comment on that and give us some insight into how that works. I understand the need to not have a three-page job description. 
Good evening. Um, it is not typical to put a mission and vision in the job description. Um, there was just a very generic statement and I worked with the team in order to put the statement that we have there. Um, it was just very generic. I believe it was two sentences. And so we tried to make it more comprehensive of what we were looking for, which is why you have the statement that you see before you tonight. I would be okay, Mr. Ballant, striking that and voting on the job description this evening. I would, I would too. Okay, so, <clears throat> so Mrs. Weber, then we would need a motion to strike that and take a vote on. Or the what we? If we go to the actual, actual job description. I guess my question would be, what what we have typically done would be we would ask. Mr. Comerford, who had initially made the motion, Mrs. Weiss seconded seconded the motion, whether they both agreed to the amendments to the initial resolution, which I'm going to need some assistance in writing. <laughs> I'm, I would agree to the amendment. That's what I. And then for clarity purposes, what is being taken from the job description? That That is my question, just to make sure that that's reflected in the minutes. I don't have it in front of me, but it's the last sentence of the, um, I guess I didn't the last I sentence that speaks to, I'm sorry. Thank you. It's the last <laughs> sentence that speaks to um, tackling the challenges, what have you. So the high school assistant principal has a strong background in curriculum and instruction, period. As well as experience, as well as PBIS. experience in PBIS. The period would be there. PBIS. That allows, the entire thing after that allows will be stricken. Okay. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford. Aye. Mrs. Weiss. Aye. Dr. Steger. Aye. Mr. Ballant. Aye. And Mrs. Bitter. Aye. Motion passes. Mr. Lewis, any other? Just for the essence of time, I'll, I'll pass on other tonight. Thank you very much. I need a motion for the approval of the treasurer, treasurer's consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any um, comments you'd like to make, Mrs. Weber? Yeah, just a, just a couple. I think um, whenever you see so many donations and in, in helping um, needy families within our district, we're very always very appreciative of those donations from our, our community. Um, one I would just highlight is um, from the Northeast Emergency Distribution Services Group. They have an affiliation with the Montgomery Women's Club and make you know, fairly frequent donations to the district and work with our, our school nurses to identify students in need and to provide them um, emergency support. So we're so appreciative of the um, work, you know, both of the Montgomery Women's Club and many things that they support us in doing and in this organization in particular. Thank you very much. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And Dr. Steger? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of the financial report, uh, January 2022. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, just a, a few comments. Um, one, we are starting to see um, our tax advances come in. You don't see much revenue coming in yet um, in January, but we're really seeing that pick up here in February. So we're starting to see that uh, those are being collected within, um, within trend. Um, I wanna point out that right now, I, I've noted a couple different times that the uh, new foundation formula is gonna be going into effect. And then we'd start to see the implementation in January. Um, at, at the end of, by the end of January, based on where, what we projected in the five-year forecast, we're already at 96% of funds received. Um, I have a feeling they're gonna need to continue to revise how they implement the foundation formula because I think that there may be some issues with how those dollars are coming in. 
um, we'll continue to follow up. I, I did note February, um, the receipts are, are much lower than what they were in January. So I think that um, we may see that, that the trend in how those come in through the remainder of the year um, decelerates quite a bit as we go forward. Um, overall, our, um, finance, our, our expenditures through January are slightly below where we had projected at this point in time of the year, but still within trend. So um, on the master facility plan report, as Mr. Lovell noted in his report, we are still within budget for all of our projects and continue to monitor those as we um, continue to see the actual expenses come in and additional contracts be um, recommended to the board. Are there any questions? This is Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. Mr. Ballant? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. And Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Motion passes. I need a motion for the approval of personnel consent agenda, which includes addendum 1B and C, as well as 2F. So moved. Second. Mrs. Weber, please call the roll. Mr. Comerford? Aye. Mrs. Weiss? Aye. Mrs. Bitter? Aye. Dr. Steger? Aye. And Mr. Ballant? Aye. Motion passes. Moving on to other Board of Education business, um, I wanted to note that our March 23rd meeting, um, evening meeting will occur at Sims Elementary School. This will be an opportunity for the board and anybody who attends to um, see the new uh, renovations at the school. This will be posted on our website as well. Second item is legislative liaison report. Mrs. Hello, Weiss. thank you. Um, all right, we got a few things going on. Um, House Bill 126, this was in regards to the process for local governments to contest property value through the existing board of revision system. Um, the version approved by the Ohio Senate will negatively impact the process for school districts to contest property value for tax purposes. It's currently in the House Ways and Means um, on a second hearing. H -bill, um, House Bill 322 is just regarding the teaching of certain current events, race and sex. Currently there are committee hearings in House, state and local government, not much movement on that. House Bill 248, this is to prohibit mandatory vaccinations, vaccination status disclosures and certain other actions regarding vaccinations and to name this act, the Vaccine Choice and Anti-Discrimination Act. This is still in the House Health Committee. House Bill 51, on Wednesday, February 9th, the Ohio House concurred in Senate amendments to House Bill 51. And just to provide some historical context for House Bill 51, in 2020, balancing the need for transparency and the need to protect the public from COVID-19, the Ohio General Assembly authorized emergency relief to the Open Meetings Act beginning March 25th, 2020 which permitted public bodies such as school boards to hold meetings and vote by teleconference, video conference, or any similar electronic means. The emergency measure was extended through June 30th of 2021, but lapsed July 1st, 2021. This means that right now, public bodies such as ours cannot meet virtually and satisfy the Open Meetings Act. Recently, substitute House Bill 51 passed both the House and Senate and is now awaiting Governor DeWine's signature. Once signed, public bodies will again be permitted to hold public meetings via teleconference. Public officials, public officials attending virtually will count toward the quorum and be permitted to vote. Uh, Senate Bill 181 is awaiting Governor DeWine's signature. This bill would establish restrictions on policies that prevent students from wearing religious apparel when competing or participating in interscholastic athletics or extracurricular activities. The bill would also permit certain officials to limit the wearing of religious apparel if a legitimate danger to participate is identified, but requires an administrator or official to offer all reasonable accommodations. Members of our team, Mr. Lewis, Mrs. Weber and myself are scheduling meetings with our um, respective representatives during hopefully the month of February. We have a meeting with Senator Wilson scheduled for February 24th and we have um, messages in to uh, representatives Miranda and Brinkman. That's all I have for legislative update. Mrs. Weber, do you have anything you'd like to add? I don't have anything to add this evening, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Weber. 
Um, next is audit liaison update, Mr. Comerford. Yes, we just uh, recently received the final audit report for the school year 2021. The audit report can be found on the Ohio Auditor of State website by using the audit search tool. The, treasurer, the treasurer's page on our district website includes a link to this audit report. As well, this report is compiled from the federal regulations as well for continuing disclosure statements and for continuing disclosure requirements for district bondholders. I wanted to, um, it's about an inch thick if you print it out and I'm not going to um, go through everything on, on the um, auditor state, but I did wanna do a couple of highlights of the findings. All the federal programs um, were audited in relation to the funding um, on the on subject to federal control. And I'll just um, read from the auditor's report. In our opinion, Sycamore Community City School District complied in all material respects with the compliance requirements referred to above that could directly and materially affect its major federal programs for the year ended June 30th, 2021. And then the summary of auditor's results in um, the schedule of findings, I'll just um, read the top uh, five. Were there any material weaknesses in the internal controls reported at the financial statement level? The finding was no. Were there any significant deficiencies in internal controls reported at the financial statement level? The, the finding was no. Was there any reported material noncompliance at the financial statement level? The finding was no. Were there any material weaknesses in the internal controls reported for major federal programs? The finding was no. Were there any significant deficiencies in internal controls reported for the major federal programs? The finding was no. So again, um, any interested parties can find this on the Auditor of State website, which you can also find a link from our district website. I'd like to take a moment to thank Mrs. Weber and her team for their excellent work. Um, our audits um, have been really um, uh, well done and the findings have been um, quite frankly spotless for the number of years that I have uh, reviewed them. So I just wanted to do uh, congratulations, Mrs. Weber, for the, the professional approach that you have done with, you, with your entire team um, for our financial um, rigor. Thank you so much. I'll make sure to pass that that along to the rest of our team. They really are the ones who make it work from day to day and with their day to day operations. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Comerford. Um, back to Mrs. Weiss, student achievement liaison update. Yes. Yeah, so we are getting back into the buildings to see all the amazing things um, our students are learning and to see our teachers and our education, our educators in action. So next week, Dr. Steger and I will be visiting Blue Ash Elementary. And I saw uh, Mrs. Combs here. So we'll look forward to meeting with her and Ms. Ammond and meeting some of our youngest aviators. So we will definitely report back to the board all the amazing things that they're doing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Weiss. Mr. Lewis, strategic planning update. I was just gonna say real quick on the last night of Mrs. Weiss, Dr. Steger, be ready to dance. If you walk into the music room, I was dancing, Mrs. Combs and I walked in to check on the students and we got roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet and so are you. So we got to dance with a number of students and it was a lot of fun. So you can add that and, to and your they resume will, as well as your theater achievements. That's right. They, <laughs> Thank you. Just know they will video record or take a picture of you while you're doing it. so. Um, you, you better get started. They're a good group. So. Uh, just strategic planning update. Um, we, we met with a provider to have some conversations about, you know, what we realized that we, and I want to say um, our, our team deserves a lot of grace because, you know, this is an item that certainly is important to us, but with everything else we have going on, it's not getting the, the attention, the we're doing things, but we're not doing them the way we would want to do them. And we're not getting the, um, you know, we've kind of looked at ourselves and said, we need someone to hold us to accountable to all these different things that we can work on and get them done. So we're working to not only revisit and re-energize the plan, but, um, you know, operationalize the plan and make it where we want it to be. And we knew at the end of 
again, we, we put it into place in 2019 and a lot changed after 2019. So uh, we met with one company to help us with, I think we thought we were just, we're not asking for a lot of help, just a little bit of help. And I don't know if they thought we were wanting to buy a yacht or <laughs> what, but the first price that we got was just not what we were looking for. And they took a second bite at it and it just wasn't there as well. So we, we told them thanks, but no thanks on that. Uh, we did not want to, we didn't even bring it to Mrs. Weber. We knew what the answer would be. So we're just seeking a partner that can help us with some of those tasks that we, we need to get done and need to get completed. And so this ended up on the board agenda because we would also like to have a board member that, you know, can help us kind of, you know, be that person that we can bounce ideas off when we get kind of things up and running and back where we want them to be and, just make sure we're checkpointing with, with someone that can speak on behalf of the board and say, yeah, you're on the right track or, you know, no way, that's not where we're headed. Just so we have that voice, you know, kind of that person sitting on our shoulder saying, hey, that's, that's where we want to go. So um, I know we brought it up at previous meetings. I just wanted to put it back on your radar. We don't have to have a decision today, but it would be nice at the next meeting if we could decide if there is someone that's interested uh, kind of understanding what that commitment of time is. I don't think it's going to be a great deal of, of time. There might be a couple of things that we would want to get you involved in up front, but um, I don't think it'll be a long longstanding um, in, in a number of hours. It'll just be maybe some assistance up front as we get this re-energized and ready to go. So that's all I had on that item, Mr. Fallon. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I have one last item. Uh, Brad and I did attend the OSBA, Ohio School Board Association Board 201 training refresher um, on Saturday. Um, it was a good group of board members ranging from 20-year veterans down to people who had somehow just been on the board a couple months yet still attended a, a secondary class. <laughs> Um, you know, I, we will share the handouts soon. Um, I suspect they're going to be very similar to what um, Dr. Steegers and Mrs. Bitter had, but uh, we'll get those out to the team. Some of the key takeaways that I had were uh, there is a webinar on 224 uh, that OSBA is sponsoring um, concerning the evaluations of superintendents and treasurers. Um, and then they also did talk about um, templates that OSBA has for board self-evaluations that they say typically occur in June or December. So I think that's going to be something that I bring back to the board after I learn more about it um, to really to, to, to dive into what the board assessments are. Um, the afternoon was spent really talking about pending litigation, uh, or sorry, legislation, which Mrs. Weiss just uh, filled us in on. Um, and then as well, talking about open, open meeting rules and parliamentary procedures. So anything you want to add, Mr. Comerford? No, I think you covered that quite well. Can I just add one thing for the meeting? I just wanted to um, give a congratulations and great job to the Super Bowl Monday um, fundraising challenge for Operation Give Back and for Sycamore Bridges. It was a great job by the entire district. So thank you to everyone and for um, putting that out there as a challenge. So thank you, Mr. Lewis and um, Mrs. Wagner. Good call out. Thank you, Dr. Stegers. Um, with that, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much.